Anyway, welcome everybody to the flight deck. Yeah, you good? Okay. Um, we're very pleased to have Ruthie here. But we're also very pleased to bring her arm candy <laughs> with her. That's Billy Joe way in the back. Stand up, Billy Joe. Now, if you have not, I know, yes. If you haven't had a chance to talk with him, please do. Because you'll find a father in the house who just will look at you and see you for you and moves in a tremendous amount of godly wisdom and humor and everything else uh, for Kim and me when we have these two here. It's just, but it's just it's, they come and it's just like, okay, they're just, they're just, we told them earlier, they're clean when they come in. It's mean they're not carrying a lot of other stuff, okay? There's, you know, and anyway, we're, we're just so grateful they're here. And Ruthie has been here before and has blown most of our minds open with that book on the motivational gifts, right? How many of you got that, read that, yeah? Yeah, we the copies of that are going out all over the place. Um, somebody who couldn't be here tonight said, "Oh, I can't believe I'm going to miss them. I've given that book out to so many people." So um, that's really had an impact for the kingdom. I know for us, it's been really helpful. We want to hear what she's got next on covenant. Um, one thing, just next week we're going to be first fruits for the month of Adar too. Okay, so like we said, we got a leap year this year. I won't go into any of that, but we'll do that. And then in two weeks we've got the pastor from Kenya coming here. Remember Pastor Samani? Okay, just a neat man of God. I mean, he first time he was here, he didn't speak or anything. He was just here for prayer, and he went to, to get in the center of the room, and he knelt down in the center of the room, and it was just like whoosh. the presence of God just fell, and it was like. You will honor this guy. I mean, it was just it was just a neat kind of thing. So we're going to have him back here uh, in two weeks from tonight. Okay? Um, do please keep praying for us with the prison ministry, with Flight Deck Discipleship. we got a new group of people who are going to go into training, but we've been locked down out of that for a couple of weeks. The, the prison's been on lockdown. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's really, we're concerned, frankly, about um, the men that we have in there that we keep contact with. And there's 28 guys, and uh, we're just, so just remember them in prayer if you would. Um, but we're encouraged we're going to add more members to the team and, and keep that going. Okay? So tonight, as I said, we've got Ruthie. Um, you know me. I had to, we were talking on the phone, and I always like to push the boundaries a little bit. So I, we talked a little bit, and then I came up with this slide. The first cut is the deepest. You understand that the first cut is all capitalized, right? So you understand who that's talking about. Who's the first? Jesus. Right? That first cut, is that's the deep one. But then this whole thing about the power of covenant in a contract world. And so Ruthie's going to come and just kind of open up her heart in a way that she does uniquely. And then in the back, you've seen, right, she's brought copies of the book and also on the motivational gifts, which I call the wiring. Either one of those is really good. So, Ruthie, come on up. I know we prayed for you before, but I'm going to do one more thing, and then you're going to let me get back there. Father, we are so grateful for this woman and for what she brings and her heart. And, Lord, we just break off any performance stuff from her so she can just be her. And, Lord, through her heart, we will be connected with your heart. Bring it, God bring it in the name of Jesus. Amen. But this is a moving people. I tell you what. It was amazing. And so many things the Lord spoke to me. And uh, can I um, can I fix this where it'll kind of slant? There you go. That's better. That's better. Okay. Okay. And we're flying with uh, some of these and so Lord show me where to go and how we're going to do this okay uh -huh. oh thank you thank you okay Lord here we go covenant when Debbie said to me ancient paths what 
What a strategic word for me. Uh, you don't know. <laughs> I've been saying because you are such kingdom people. And uh, covenant is, would you hand me my Bible right there? Um, this one is good. Covenant is the book. But it's an ancient path. And it's one that the Lord's been speaking to me for a long time, and I've only scratched the surface, and many of you probably know a lot of the stuff I'm going to share, and that's good, and together it can get better. Um, but this is very foundational. This is the basics. I told Bill Joe last night, I said, this is basics 101. <laughs> Welcome to Covenant. But um, I've looked at Covenant for a long time uh, and couldn't, I had pieces for years, just pieces. And I would see that and I'd think, wow, that's amazing. Wow, that's amazing. But about five years ago, I heard a teaching on the Goel, which is not Noel, but Goel. And it pulled all of it together for me. And I began to see more and more and more. So I wrote it down in a book. And uh, as I was praying, I was just saying, well, Lord, where do you start with covenant? How do, how do, where do I go from here? How do I do this? Um, because I've taught on aspects of covenant. I've taught on weddings. I love to do women's retreats, and women love to talk about weddings. Uh, the Jewish wedding is such a part of covenant. It is a picture of covenant. I've taught on the feast, picture of covenant. Taught on the tabernacle, picture of covenant. I've taught on the first seven days in creation. It's covenant. So where do you start? And the scripture that the Lord dropped in my heart was Jesus crucified from the foundation of the earth. Covenant. Foundation. It is the foundation. And so as I was at a women's retreat teaching on the bride and guys, if we can be warriors, you can be a bride. <laughs> he created them male and female for his bride. At the wedding supper of the Lamb, we will all be his bride. So I, I had this vision, and I wrote it down, and um, I want to share that with you first to give a jumping-off place for covenant, okay? I'm just going to share. I'm just going to read from the book. It's easier for me, okay? <laughs> The following is a drama that I imagined how it could have been. He was crucified from the foundation of the earth. So go with me into eternity before time was created. A place where there was one Elohim existed alone without another like himself. There were angels there because Ezekiel tells us that Lucifer had fallen long before the earth was created and had taken with him one-third of the angelic realm. And Job declared that the morning stars, possibly angelic beings, sang when he pulled up the land from the deep waters. The stars were not created yet. They weren't there till the fourth day. So, as an integral part of his being, light and worship were there. We know that. And yet, a heart deeper than any ocean and wider than any sky yearned for an other like himself. He desired a bride. In the vast nothingness, chaos reigned as Elohim hovered over the dark waters of disarray and confusion. And the only sound heard or felt was the deep cry of a lonely heart yearning for his other. 
This other would complete his joy, receive his kindness, and echo back his love. Pure joy must be, and love must be given away freely, or it's really not love at all. And love without an object to receive it is meaningless. Pure love is what made this mysterious community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit truly one God, Elohim. In the profound intensity of his yearning, Elohim conceived a plan. He would make an other like his aunt himself. Lovely and creative, she would know life in the fullest sense. She would be like him, a spirit, soul, and body, male and female. She would dream. She would know joy. And yes, she would know sorrow. As he visualized his plan unfolding, he recognized his old adversary Lucifer would be standing by yet again, ready to steal, kill, and destroy any object of his love. Oh, but she would love him back, wouldn't she? Surely she would choose him. But love without choice is not love either. It's bondage, and love must be freely given and freely received, or it becomes bondage. And bondage can never be described as love. She must be free to choose. As he pondered the vision end from the beginning, with a broken heart, he knew what her choice would be. He knew the beguiling lies of the father of lies would be too strong for her and would draw her away and bring her into bondage and steal her destiny, the destiny of becoming his bride, his other. No, that must never happen. He knew even before she came to be that he must find a way back for her, a way for him to catch her should she fall, a way to set her free should she become enslaved, a way to bring her back should she face the horror and death. He must find a way. And so the conversation between this mysterious community began. The father spoke to his son, I know the yearning in your heart for an other, and I have envisioned for you a worthy, noble bride to fulfill the deep, burning desire of your heart. And catching the vision from his father, and with great joy and expectancy, the son declared, O oh, father, she is altogether lovely. One glance of her eyes, and my heart will be captivated forever. With deep anguish, the father spoke again, but alas... I also see our old adversary Lucifer will come to steal her heart with his mesmerizing voice and his bewitching lies. She will listen to him and choose to believe him and go with him. And there she will be wounded unto death. And he will put shackles on her ankles. And he will veil her eyes so that she cannot see clearly. And he will cause her to believe that she is beyond repair and no longer beautiful to us. Our enemy will take everything from her, her dignity, her honor, her destiny, especially her destiny. He will cover her with shame, bringing her as a slave into his realm of death, hell, and the grave. With a burning zeal, the son spoke again to his father and said, but I will buy her back from slavery. Though it will cost me everything I have, though it cost me my very life, my glory and my riches and my honor are meaningless without her. And with fervency, he continued, I have a plan. I will take her into the wilderness and I will pursue her. I will take the shackles off her feet so she can run with me over the mountains. I will heal her wounds with the ointment of my love and I will lift her head so that she can see herself reflected in my eyes, pure and spotless, clothed with restored glory, honor, and dignity. The spirit of truth and wisdom rose slowly to speak, and a holy hush descended over all eternity. Like the roar of many waters resonating through the heavens, he spoke. From the deepest treasures of eternity, I bring forth the sacred truth. It is a truth too deep for our adversary Lucifer to perceive or fathom. 
and this truth exists only in our knowledge. It is the truth of the blood covenant. Deafening silence continued as all of heaven stood still to listen. This was a strange and unfathomable truth that had never been spoken throughout the ages of eternity. Wisdom and truth solemnly proceeded. The covenant must be sealed with pure, holy blood at the altar known as the mercy seat behind the veil of holiness. Here at the holiest place in the throne room, you must bind yourself to her through the irrevocable oath of covenant, sealed with your own blood. It is at this altar that you will marry her and you will invoke the law of the Gael to redeem her as her kinsman. You will take vengeance on her enemy as her blood avenger. You will buy her back from slavery, restore her inheritance as her redeemer, and reinstate her destiny as her husband. But first, know these two truths. It is imperative that you go freely of your own choice. Otherwise, the authority is lost. And just as vital, she must have the freedom to choose. A roar like that of a lion filled the heavens, ringing out over all created time and eternity. With great joy, the sun shouted, and on our wedding day, she will be mine again. Our adversary will be cast down forever, and she will sit by my side reflecting my glory. Because of my great love for her, she will choose me forever. Then the three in one Elohim, understanding the exorbitant price, agreed that this was the only way. Together, the father with a heavy heart, the son with a glint of burning passion in his eye, slowly walked to the ancient stone altar to meet the spirit of wisdom and truth. And there, at the mercy seat, the Son took the oath of the blood covenant and was crucified from the foundation of the earth. As his pure holy blood streamed down the sides of the ancient altar, the Ruach, the very breath of the Father thundered, let there be light. And the song of creation and redemption came to be. For I have set you as an unbreakable seal upon my heart and upon my arm. My love for you is as strong as death itself, and my burning zeal for you is as relentless as the grave. Torrential floods of water cannot quench the fire of my love for you, my sister, my bride. For you are bought with a price. Blood covenant. blood covenant. In Hebrews it tells us without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sin. Covenant. It was birthed in passion and love but it was legally paid for by his blood. There's life in the blood. It was blood or blood. In today's society, we speak a different language, but as his bride, we need to change our language. We speak from contracts. Contracts are based on distrust. I don't really trust you to do what you say you're going to do. So we're going to draw up this contract because I don't trust you. But a covenant is eternal and it is based on trust. I will do this for you. Everything in this book 
You can count on it. You can build on it. Whether you do it or not, my word is true because I am bound by covenant for it to be true. I will do everything I have said in this book because I am bound by covenant. Contract, limited time. How many of us pay a mortgage for 30 years and then it's over? It's ended. This contract is temporary. I will do this. I'm going to pay you this salary for as long as you work for me. But when you do this, this, or this, the contract's over. You have violated. It's ended. Covenant until death do us part. Covenant is eternal. Covenant is generational. It's in the blood. It's about the root of Jesse. It's about the root. I was looking for a movie this week that I know we have somewhere. It's called A Walk in the Clouds. Has anybody ever seen it? And the vineyard burns, but they find the root. There is a root that is grounded in covenant. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but before that, Jesus. The root is what's important with covenant, and it's eternal, and it requires death. We don't like to speak of death sometimes, but it's covenant. Covenant contracts can be broken. If you don't do what you say you're going to do, we can break this covenant. Now, you may have to pay an extra 50000 but hey, it's all right. We can break it. We can walk away. We listened to a covenant statement by Miles Monroe, and he said most people need to get married down at the courthouse because it's a legal binding, but then you go back to the courthouse to have it annulled or have divorced. Because when you make a covenant in the presence of God, it is eternal, it is generational, it is till death to use part. We tend to forget that in our culture. Covenant cannot be broken. If you can break my covenant with the sun and the moon, the day and the night, then my covenant can be broken. The sun came up this morning. Did you see it? <laughs> it is night. But we expect the sun to come up in the morning. Now, if the sun doesn't come up, it'll be over. But it'll be eternity. Because God's covenant is eternal. It was paid for by His Son's precious blood. Eternal. Covenant. We were created as his bride, created through passion, love, and loyalty. But we became a widow when Adam fell. I'm going to be talking to you about the Gael tonight because I want you to understand who Jesus is. Gael is a Hebrew word and it means kinsman redeemer. Now when I say kinsman redeemer, most of you think Boaz and Ruth. Beautiful picture of kinsman redeemer. But the kinsman redeemer law was in the earth a long, long time before Boaz and Ruth came about. We saw the kinsman redeemer law in uh, Tamar and Judah. But it was in the earth before that. Covenant was in the earth before that. I had a sweet redemptive gift teacher ask me, where'd you get all this information? <laughs> a lot of it came out of Erdman's Encyclopedia of the Dial. For, for those teachers in here, it's in Erdman's. They and studied the ancient Hittites. 
because the Hittites were in the earth before God called Abraham and they had covenant ceremony so that when God said to Abraham, Abraham, I want to make a covenant with you, Abraham knew what he was talking about and he knew not to enter it lightly. He had to know God for about 13 to 20 years before he was willing to step into covenant with God because they understood covenant was till death do us part. So it's not like let's go to lunch. It's different. We say that in our marriage ceremony. I have a friend and when she got married she said I knew he'd be a good first husband. Now God got a hold of both of them and they're saved and been married 40 something years. Praise God. But it's our mindset. We live in a contract world and we have to understand what we say is important because we represent a covenant God in the earth. And he wants us to understand what a covenant cost him, what a covenant looks like. And he wants us to understand who his son is. He has many names. Oh, he is the Prince of Peace. He is the Mighty Warrior. He is Lord Sabaoth. He is Jehovah Ropha. He is Jehovah Sitkano. He is all of these. But basically and foremost, he is the Goel. He is our kinsman redeemer because it took a kinsman redeemer to redeem a widow. And in the beginning, Adam and Eve were perfect and God created them in the garden for fellowship with him. We talked about it earlier. What kind of leaf did they pick off the tree? When they sinned, it broke God's heart. It was infidelity. The bride had gone astray. She had committed adultery. When they sinned, the relationship was broken. But I'm telling you, his passion and his heart for you and for us and for all of his bride was until death do us part. He is passionate for you. One glance of your eyes has captured his heart and he was broken. The first religious act in the earth was when they picked a fig leaf, I think, and tried to cover themselves. Anything we do that we try to cover ourselves is religion because it doesn't have relationship. Any activity without relationship is religious spirit. <coughs> so they tried to cover themselves because you see with sin comes shame and the enemy wants to cover us with shame just a minute <coughs> but the Lord's laid on him the iniquity of us all so in the garden there is an innate need in every one of us to be clothed and covered. <coughs> Sorry. Covering is important. It's important to God. The mercy seat is covered. The throne is covered with glory and worship. <coughs> and Adam and Eve were covered with glory. But when they sinned, the glory was gone and they were naked and they were uncovered. <coughs> but God poured out blood in the earth. He sacrificed an animal himself and covered them. Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. So now what do we do? Death has come into the earth. Thank you. <clears throat> Good. 
So death is in the earth. Who's dead? We are. We're a widow. So God put laws, you know, there is the law of uh, electromagnetic power. There is the laws of uh, dynamics, thermodynamics. There are laws that were in the earth as soon as God spoke light. And one of those laws that he put into the earth was to make a way where there was no way for the widow. And he brought forth the law of the kinsman redeemer. <clears throat> His passion was the way, covenant was the how, and the Lord brought forth the kinsman redeemer. His son would redeem the bride who was widowed. The qualifications in order to be the kinsman redeemer are these. First of all, you've got to have a widow or it doesn't work, okay? But when there's a widow in all of creation, all the people in the earth are widows, he has to be a near kinsman. Well, who was Adam's father? God. Who was Jesus' father? God. Could we say Adam and Jesus were brothers? Brothers are the closest next of kin. Had to be of Jewish descent. Had to be Abraham's son. And Jesus was Adam's brother. The next, he had to have the assets to redeem the widow. Because back then, if you couldn't eat after your husband died and, and you were poor, sometimes you sold yourself into slavery to be able to take care of yourself and your children. You had to find a way. You just had to find a way. So you could be sold into slavery. Maybe she owed debts. Kinsman Redeemer had to have the money to do it. Had to have the assets to redeem the widow. Well, let's think about that a minute. What were Jesus' assets? Let's see. He created the heavens and the earth. He has a thousand uh, cows on a thousand hills. I think he has the assets to buy back the widow, don't you? And he had to be willing to. It was always a choice. It was her choice to sin or not. It is his choice to redeem or not to redeem. Because we have the story of Ruth and Boaz and her closest kinsman redeemer chose not to redeem her. And Boaz redeemed her. Always had a choice. Jesus said, no man takes my life. I lay it down for you. So, the four requirements were to cover her. Did we already? He had to. Here's what he would have to do. Now, if there's the widow, he has the choice to do this or not. He's got to have the means to do it. Here is what he would have to do. Marry her and bring her out of slavery. Does that sound familiar? Have you been a slave to sin? He had to avenge her enemies and bring her justice. Always avenge the enemies. Pay her debts to redeem her. But the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Christ. And then he had to bring her into full restoration of inheritance. And the word restoration means to bring her back into the original intent, which was the bride of Christ. And we see that in the last chapter of our covenant book, we see the wedding feast of the Lamb. And we're going to talk about that some more in a minute. He had to be willing to do these things. Has he done these things in your life? Yes. Is he your goel? He's your kinsman redeemer. 
the original intent was in the garden to have relationship with the bride. Now we're going to talk about sevening. Seven. We see seven everywhere in the Bible. When you seven yourself to another person, it means you cut covenant with them. To seven yourself is a covenant. It's always seven. Seven is the completeness. Seven days in creation, seven feasts. By the way, the feast or the wedding rehearsal for the tabernacles and the wedding. Seven days of tabernacles, seven churches in Revelation, seven pieces of furniture in the tabernacle because God took 4,000 years painting a picture of covenant for us to make us understand and give us a full understanding of who Jesus was and what he came to do and how he would do it. 4,000 years. He gave us pictures of the feast. He gave us pictures in Torah. He gave us pictures with all of the prophets. And in that day, I will write my uh, covenant on her heart. Can I break covenant with the sun and the moon? No, I will keep my covenant. All through the Word, He's talking about covenant. All through the Word, He's trying to get you to see His assets as the kinsman redeemer. Look at what I've done for you. When you walk through the fire, you're not going to be burned because I'm your kinsman redeemer. And I created the fire, so I know how to keep you in the fire. I'm your kinsman redeemer. Look at what I have. You need provision. I've got it for you. What do you need? Salvation? Do you need deliverance? Do you need healing? Do you need financial provision? What do you need? I've got it for you because I have all the assets you will ever need to meet any need that you might ever have because I am your kinsman redeemer and I have come to redeem you. Yes. I've called you by my name. My name. When I married Billy Joe Young, I lost the name of Carol and I became a Young. And I want everybody to know I'm Mrs. Young. I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. Will you take my name? Will you marry me? I'm in love with you. Will you marry me? I've got this down because I'm going to take some to get busy. <laughs> I am really trying to stay behind this microphone. <laughs> so we're going to talk about what did covenant look like when God called Abraham to covenant with him. Very important. Kim, if I could get that um, cup, just sit it right up here. I'm going to need that in just a minute. Communion. And, huh? the, communion. the communion cup, if you don't mind. So what does covenant look like? And why is it important that we understand every portion of covenant? Covenant has seven portions. And we're going to talk about each one of those portions. If you'll just sit it right there. Thank you. Oh, you used that cup. I like that. The preamble. We all know. We the people of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> preamble, okay? We're going to talk about the preamble. Okay. The preamble identifies the parties of who's coming and it identifies their gods. And this is very, very important. Because you see, they were a spiritual people and they understood there is a spiritual world up here and they all worshiped gods. 
and I have this God and you've got this God and my God's better than your God. Why in the world did God send all those plagues to Egypt? Because every one of those plagues represented a God. And so he had to show his authority over all ten of those Egyptian gods and finally it's life or death. And he had to show, I am the Lord your God. I am. Covenant. Who's coming to this covenant? And why are you coming to make covenant with me? So God's making covenant with Abraham. And when they came, now think about this. I thought about this the last time I talked Kim and I thought about you, you know? We come into covenant, say Debbie and I are two kings, and we're coming into covenant with each other. She's bringing her gods, and I'm bringing my gods. Now when we get there, we understand the gods are our witness to this covenant. It says the angels are looking at us. There is a spiritual dimension in the heavenlies that watch us, and they watch what God does in covenant. And so the preamble lays out that, you know, they had a scribe that was writing every word that was said. And if I agree with you or I agree with Debbie, with this covenant, till death do us part, it doesn't mean, it, it means she has the right to kill me if I don't keep covenant. But if I don't, one of the things you say in that preamble, if I don't keep covenant with you, your gods have access to me. Now we know that's demonic. We know there are demonic deities who want to be worshipped. And when I open myself up and make a covenant with someone and they are not in covenant with the king of kings and lord of lords, I am opening myself up to demonic control. My word. That's a frightening thing. Because there's only one I want to be in covenant Hallelujah. with and that's he's the king. So when they came together, they understood this is not just physical. This is a spiritual thing that we're doing. They were spiritual people. We sometimes in our Western mindset get so culturally oriented, we forget there's a spiritual dimension. You don't in this house, but I know we do some. The preamble. The next is the prologue. Now these things are important. Prologue. That describes the relationship of the parties. Who are you and who am I? And so I'm going to pretend Debbie is king. You want to be the king, or okay, or Noah, either one. I'm, I, I need a I need a cohort here to help me walk covenant out. Okay, Noah, get up here. All right. <laughs> oh, no. Stand right here. Okay. Okay. So let's say Noah is a king, and I'm a king, and he's got five thousand acres, and I've only got two hundred. Okay. I would like to be in covenant with Noah because he's got the stuff. He's got the stuff. He's got cows and servants. you got a lot of stuff. All right. I need some. Okay. So we're coming together to make covenant. Now, we discuss when we come together, we don't just do this one afternoon. Okay? Let's just go make a covenant this afternoon. It takes preparation. He's going to bring sacrifices. He's going to bring the best wine that he has. All of his servants are going to come to witness. He's going to bring wood for the altar. He's going to bring his best wine. He's going to bring animals to sacrifice. Because yep. we're going to kill some animals. Yep. Okay, We're going to dress in our best. My mama used to call it your Sunday best. You know? We don't dress up for church like we used to, but we used to, didn't we? <laughs> you dress in your finest robes. So we've come together and we have agreed that our gods are witnessing this. Yep. And we understand that. And you have yours. I hope he's the king. And I have mine and mine's <laughs> the king. So. Okay. <laughs> so now in the prologue, what we are saying is who are you and who am I? Yeah. And here's what I have. 
and there's what you have, okay? Mm -hmm. And we lay all that out. The requirements and the stipulations and the responsibilities. Okay, so we see what he's got, we see what I've got. Stipulations of both parties. These Now look at these stipulations. The Lord said when he was making covenant, I'm the Lord. Who are the gods in this covenant? The Lord. I'll bring you out from the burdens of Egypt. Remember the kinsman redeemer? He's going to bring you out by a strong right hand. I'll rescue you from bondage and I'll be your blood avenger. I will bring you justice. I will redeem you with my outstretched arm. I will pay the price. And I'll take you as my people and I will marry you. That sounds like the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. Okay, we're going to go back, I'm sorry, and talk about the stipulations. What's going to be required? So, what we're saying as kings of what's required is if I get into trouble, you're going to come help me because we're in covenant. If I go to war, you're going to bring your armies to me because I'm in covenant with him. I'm making covenant with him. So we are agreeing. When I get injustice, you're going to come to the rescue, right? Okay, covenant is like we're not marrying each other because kings didn't get married that way, but what it was the same as till death do us part. Yeah. You're going to do this till death do you part. Yeah. Wouldn't you like to be in covenant with Jesus? Amen. Because if I go to war, he's going to come to war with me. Amen. If I get injustice, he's going to come and take care of my case. Amen. He's going to be there for me because I'm in covenant and he's bound to it. It's not a choice anymore. He made the one choice. No more choices. We're in covenant. Then the next, well, how is this going to be passed on? Okay, now, is this going to be your son and my son and your, their son and their son? Generation to generation, okay? We're going generation. So when I die, my sons don't still be in covenant with him and still have access to everything he has. And he has access to everything I have. Why he would want it, I don't know. <laughs> but he does. He has access. It gives me access to him. Hmm? Oh, number three was the stipulations okay. requirements. Okay, those four requirements. Um, the secession. How is God going to pass this covenant on? He said, I want you to remember covenant from generation to generation to generation. I want when people see you to just look at you and know you are in covenant. Hand me that right there. So in Leviticus he says, I want every time, I want you to start wearing these fringes. Now these fringes have five knots. Two fringes to a corner and each, that means the Ten Commandments. I want you to wear these fringes everywhere you go because it's an outward sign of covenant. Mm -hmm. Outward. And it's also a sign that... Find, find the top of it. I'm going to cover you with covenant. Do you know that this... Any time you see in the scripture the word wings, under his wings, this is a wing. It is covenant. It's the wing of covenant. I will bear you on eagle's wings. I will bear you on my covenant because I'm carrying you in covenant. A skirt. 
The word skirt is covenant. The woman knew, so shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And so she knew if she could touch his wings, if she could just touch that fringe, she would be healed. And so she reached up and touched his wing. When Ruth went to Boaz and she said, You're my kinsman redeemer. Cover me with your skirt. It was this. Cover me with covenant. Protect me. Cover me. Keep me. Buy me back. Bring justice from my enemies. Marry me. And he reached over and covered her under his skirt, his wing. Anytime you read in the Psalms and it says, I will dwell with her, that's eternal dwelling in covenant. I will cover you. It's this word, connect. Cover, wings, skirt. God was painting a picture for thousand years. He was putting this in the earth. He was putting the sun and the moon in the earth. He was putting uh, prophets in the earth saying, I'm going to put my law in your heart. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bring you back to the land. You've broken heart with me. You've broken your covenant with me, but you know what? I don't break my covenant. You've not walked in covenant, but I will walk in covenant with you because I paid it in a blood price. Covenant is eternal. And so he told them, he said, I want you to teach your children about covenant. I want you to put the word on the door. When they go in, they'll see it. Now, get this picture out in the desert. And Torah, by the way, is covenant. All the people couldn't get in the tent, the tabernacle, it wasn't that big. But the men were commanded every morning to get under, which side is it? No, we're not through. That's okay, that's all right. Stand outside your tent and make a little tent. I want relationship with every man and family in this camp. Only the priest could go in that tabernacle, but every man could go under his own tallit, his own covenant. And every morning they would get up and they would say, uh, the, not what the Lord our God is one and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul all your mind all your strength every seventh day they would light candles and remember covenant this is the seventh day seventh day is created for relationship it's always about relationship so they were to teach their children. So every morning those children heard their father praising God in the mornings. And that little boy couldn't wait till he was 12 years old. And he could get his own to lead. And in that day he would say, I don't serve the God of my fathers anymore. This day his God has become my God. Hallelujah. Today. Hallelujah. And I get my own covenant because I'm 12 years old and I'm a man now. And I can stand under my own covenant. Hallelujah. Um, when a bride went up, she came out with her father and his covenant. But when they got to the chuppah, he would, the father would look at his daughter and say, are you willing to leave my covenant to go under his covenant? There was a whole preliminary for that groom could come and stand in that place. He had to be examined. He had to make sure that he knew Torah. I mean, the community, the father, he had to pray the bride price. He had to bring a ketubah. Praise God for ketubahs. I'll tell you about it in a minute. But at that point, she would look at her father. She would look at this new husband. And she would choose 
and he would stand there and when he walked up he would wrap her in his tallit the tallit wrap was when they were officially married because only the two of them under this covenant a tallit wrap because God wanted them to understand it's a picture of me and my bride. You see, he's engaged to the most lovely, wonderful, glorious bride. And he can't wait till his wedding day. Covenant. And he's waiting. So we're going to look to kings coming for covenant. I'm, I, I can't do this and this, so I'm going to just do this. There was always a succession plan. You will celebrate it. And then the cutting of flesh. Okay, so here we are. We're just going to walk this out real quick. Okay? okay. You ready? Yes. And I'm just saying before heaven and earth, I'm not making covenant in the natural with Noah. Just let that be. I'm in covenant with one man back there. <laughs> So we come and we are dressed in our regal robes. He has brought everything he needs. We have set it out that our gods are witness and who our gods are. We have set out what you have and what I have and what we have brought. And now it is time for the cutting of flesh. Okay? He has, we've gone and we have built an altar and we have lit a fire. Okay? So now he takes his ram and I take my ram and we slice it down the middle. Now I don't let my servants do it. I do it myself. I have on my ro robes. You have on your best. And yet both of us, I remember Abraham went up to worship God with a knife in his hand. Covenant is bloody and it is gruesome, but it is holy. And don't ever forget how holy it is. So we begin to sacrifice the animals. And it's nasty and you sacrifice. And then we lay those animals side by side. His on that side, mine on this side. We've got the fire built at the altar up there. And we, the two of us, begin to walk what is known as the blood path. Now think about Abraham for a minute. He killed the animals. He had the altar. But when it came time to walk the blood path, God sovereignly covered him and Abraham went to sleep. Because God knew no man, save one, could walk this blood path with him and make covenant in the earth. And I can't help but believe that as God was walking down that blood path, that he was, you know, he lives outside of time. And he was looking ahead because there was going to be another blood path in the earth. And there would be one man who would be able to walk that blood path because you couldn't do it. And he said to you, Noah, you can't because if you do this, it's death. It's eternal death. It's eternal death because you can't keep this covenant. But I tell you what, Noah, I've got a son. Mm -hmm. And my son's going to come with your kind of DNA. Mm -hmm. And my son's going to stand there for you. And instead of you walking this path, Noah, my son is going to step up and say, Father, he can't do it. I'll do it for him. Let me do it for him. Let me be the one to walk that blood path up to the altar. So God 
and looking ahead, walk the blood path together. When they got to the end, they got to the altar. And we put the right that I believe of the sheep on this altar. I put mine on there. And Noah, you put yours on there. And it's cooking. You know what smells wonderful to God? The aroma of burning flesh. So we come to the altar. No, just get right over here. And uh, I'm going to let you hold this cup. Okay? It's full, man. Yeah. It is full. So we reach and we get a piece of my meat. And I say to Noah the king, Noah, I say, Noah, this is representing my body. Have you ever heard those words before? This represents my body. And this represents my body. And in this covenant ceremony, I give you the right and the authority to cut me and to spill my blood. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you, Noah, this is my flesh. And when I give you this flesh, you're going to have some of my DNA in you. And so I give that to Noah. Mm -hmm. And then Noah takes some and he gives me his flesh. Mm -hmm. And then we proclaim to everybody there because there's witnesses and we proclaim before heaven we are now one flesh. He has my DNA, I have his DNA. And then we bring our wines and we pour your wine in here and we pour my wine in here and we say this represents our blood. So Noah, when you drink this blood, you are drinking my blood. Did you ever make blood brothers and sisters when you were little? We're going to be blood brothers. And so you cut yourself. Well, we're, hold this just a minute. We're going to take a knife and we're going to cut ourselves and we're going to literally put our blood in this cup. He used a nine inch spike to carve your name on his hand when he cut covenant with you. And Noah's going to cut his hand. We're going to put our blood together. And we say, we are one blood. Everything I have is yours. Everything you have is mine. We are in covenant with each other until death do us part. Because should he break the covenant, he will die. And should I break the covenant, I will die. And we drink the blood of covenant at the altar. I'm going to put this back yeah. over here. Sure. Then, it's really full. there's more. We're not done yet. It's okay. We're going to take some ashes from this altar. Mm -hmm. And we're going to put ashes in that cut because I want a good scar. We want a good scar. He has nail-pierced hands. I want the scar. So every time I look at my hand, I can see, oh, I'm in covenant with Noah. And every time he looks at his hand, he's going to say, oh, I'm in covenant with her. And so when I have a need, I can call on covenant. And covenant is there for me. But you see, remember, there are witnesses in the heavens that are watching this ceremony. And I'm going to tell you, when I, I'm over here and I'm just doing my stuff and a king over here comes against me and he starts lining up, you're going to come against me? 
He's coming against me. He's bringing all his army. <laughs> but you know what I do? I go out to him. I hold up my hand. I hold it. You can come over this way better so we can stay here. I hold up my hand. What do you see? A scar yeah. with a lot of ashes and a big bad scar. Now what he knows is if I go to war against her, I'm going to have to go to war against Noah and her. I might better back off. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. You are written on the palm of his hand. Yes. And I'm going to tell you, when your enemy comes up against you and you hold up your hands in worship and praise, yes. Lord Sabaoth walks up behind you. Wow. <laughs> this is good. This is good. Yeah. Lord Sabaoth with his armies of millions comes to your rescue not because you just look cute not because he thinks you're great but because he is bound by covenant he has no choice but to come to your rescue and he comes with burning passion in his eyes he is thrilled to come and rescue his bride because that's his part of being a kinsman redeemer. I will release you from bondage and slavery. I will pay the price for you. I will bring you justice. I will avenge your enemies and I will bring you into full restoration. I will bring you back to the original intent that I intended when I created you in the garden. You are mine. I have bought you with the blood price of covenant. Thank you, Lord. Don't you like being in covenant with a king? Thank you, Noah. I think he did great, don't you? <laughs> oh, there was one other part, two other parts, and then we'll be about done. Okay. What time is it? Okay. One other part. He's going to take off his coat. You can just stand right there. He's taking off his robe. Well, you don't have to. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll have to give you... Okay. We're exchanging robes. Now, look at the one he's got. It's covenant. And I've got his. Now, when I go to town wearing this... People look at that and say, Well, that's Noah coming down there. Because I look like him. I've got his coat. That means every, he's given me the coat off his back. If I need something and I don't have the means to get it, I just say, go see Noah. Because I've got his robe. And we exchange. <laughs> we exchange shoes. No, I'm not swapping shoes. <laughs> because everywhere he walks is mine. And everywhere I walk, belongs to him. The sole of your feet, Joshua, wherever your feet touch, it's covenant. I'm going to take it. I'm going to give it to you everywhere you talk. Walk. And last of all, we exchange weapons. When I go to war, you go to war. Come on. What are our weapons? The weapons of warfare are not carnal but are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds because we have his weapons. We are in covenant. And the last part is we have a feast. Seven days. I hope you brought a lot of covered dishes. We have got the casseroles. Get the casseroles out. We have a feast. We party for seven days because we've prepared for covenant. Thank you, Noah. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to read one more thing and then we will be ending. I'm sorry I've left my PowerPoints.
I just want to talk just a minute about Passover. Because God cut covenant with Abraham and Jesus cut covenant with us at Passover. And look at those four cups. Jesus had celebrated Passover for 32 years. He knew the script well. He knew exactly what was happening. God had rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it for thousands of years. They all knew Passover. They understood we put blood on the door. That he came to Passover. And he said to his disciples, This day I have longed to celebrate Passover with you. I used to read that and think, Oh, he was real excited about celebrating Passover. Mm-hmm. No. He said, I've longed to celebrate with you. For 4,000 years of time, I have been waiting for this moment because I knew when I come to earth to cut the covenant with my bride, she's soon going to be in the earth. I've longed for this day. And when you read, they always read Psalms 118. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Be joyful and sing as we go up to the altar. This was his wedding day. At this day, he would stand before all eternity. All of the gods and demons in heaven would be standing as witness as he cut Passover in the earth. He had longed for this day. And he picked up the cup, the first cup, and it says, I will. I will bring you out of slavery. Our kinsman redeemer, the four laws of the kinsman redeemer, I will bring you out of slavery. And they drank that cup. The second one, I will avenge your enemies and bring you justice. It's called the cup of deliverance. And then during that t- after that second cup, they went and found that you've all celebrated Passover. So you know about the afikoman. And he goes and gets the afikoman, the bread. And from that moment on, everything changed. 4,000 years, they had done it this way. And all of a sudden, everybody goes on alert. Because he takes that afikoman, and he picks it up, and he breaks that bread, and he says... Watch this, boys. Everything has changed today. This is my body. Remember the covenant ceremony? This is my body broken for you. And today we cut covenant. And he handed them the body and they ate the bread. And then he took this cup the cup of redemption. I will redeem you. I will stand in your place, Noah, when I walk that blood path. I am on my way to the covenant altar to pay the price not in a lamb's blood, but in the lamb's blood. And he lifted this cup and he said, I will buy you back. Your price is blood and I'll pay it. And he held up this cup. And they all drank the cup of redemption. And tonight that's what we're going to offer to you. He said, I want you to do this. And I want you to remember. Remember. Wear it on your head. Put it on your doorpost. Wear a fringe. And he said, 
But the cut that you have will not be the circumcision cut. We talked about cutting on the hands, but with Abraham, he said, I want you to circumcise. That way, every seed Abraham goes through the cut of covenant. Every seed will be under covenant and will be remembered. Today, I'm going to tell you, you don't have to be circumcised because I want to circumcise your heart. I want you to pay the price in your heart. That's the sign. And I want you to wear a sign. And it's not a fringe. They will know you are mine because of the way that you love one another. When we do not walk in His love, we're not showing the sign of covenant in this new covenant that He made with us. I'm going to put this down again. So as he walked up the blood path, he went to the altar. Let's go up to the horns of the altar. It's a joyful day. This is the day. This is the day. So I had, a, had another vision. I always write my visions. <laughs> So you get to hear it again, and this is where I'm going to end. Cutting covenant is not pretty. It is brutal. It is bloody, but it is holy. As I was pondering the crucifixion one morning, I had a vision of Lord Sabaoth in full battle array, stepping down from his brilliant white war steed and standing at attention, armed, ready, and fully able to defeat every foe of hell and the grave. And I watched as this mighty warrior king regally removed his helmet and released it to his enemy nearby. Instead of drawing his sword, he bowed his head, and a crown of thorns pierced his scalp, and drops of blood trickled down his strong, solemn face. At that moment, I realized the price of the helmet of salvation cost him everything. Rather than a crown of glory and light, he wore a crown of thorns. And I wept as I realized how lightly I take each piece of my spiritual armor. My price was paid in blood. And next I saw him take off and lay aside his royal robe, the robe of authority. He was stripped, no longer covered, so that I could have the privilege and honor of being covered by his covenant robe, his delete. As he handed over all of his weapons, the demonic forces cheered, and the angelic host of heaven stood at attention, awaiting the signal to attack. It was a signal that never came. The sound of the cat of nine tails lashed, reverberated in my ears, and I tried to stop the noise and the chaos, the horror of what I was witnessing, but the cruelty continued. The skin on his back was torn into bloody shreds, and he spoke not a word. Our kinsman redeemer would wait until the cross to speak his last profound words, releasing forgiveness to his executioners. As the blood ran down his back and his legs and his feet, Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled. By his stripes you are healed. This was the blood path that he must walk for my redemption. This is the price of covenant keeping. As I gazed on this warrior king, beaten, bloody, and in agony, the voice of the Lord whispered, Behold your covenant keeper, your kinsman redeemer. Cutting covenant is not a pretty sight. It is brutal, it is bloody, but it is very, very holy. The hand of the Lord is mentioned 1,273 times in the Bible. His hand is terrible, strong, mighty, and gentle. By his hand he does wonders, saves, delivers, creates, and heals. And yet, in Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled as he willingly allowed the Roman soldiers to engrave my name on the palm of his hand. 
with a nine-inch spike. Piercing his beautiful feet was the price paid for me to leap and to dance and to walk in his path of righteousness. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring us the gospel of good news. Again, Father, forgive us when we take it so lightly what he did. At three in the afternoon, the lamb at the temple was sacrificed by cutting its throat. As the blood ran down the sides of the altar, the priest shouted, It is finished. The debt has been paid. And simultaneously outside the city on a hill of Golgotha, the voice of the Lamb rang out across eternity. It is finished. The debt has been paid. When Jesus shouted, it is finished, the Hebrew word he shouted was asa, which means complete, to create, to bring to perfection, to make war, and to avenge. In essence, Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, roared triumphantly, Asa, accomplished. I have paid the debt. I have avenged your enemies. I have made war on your enemies. I have brought you to perfection. Come forth, new creation. The power of the cross is wrapped up in one word. I saw my debt for sin has been paid and I will now walk out the rest of my life as a new creation because I am engraved on the palm of his hand. As blood and water flowed down his side, he gave birth to this new creation his bride. He made her pure and spotless and giving her a new life and victory over her enemy, the prince of darkness. At this moment, the bridegroom flung his tallit over all of creation. This was the tallit wrap of the centuries. She was now his. He had created her. And now she was his because he had bought her back and paid the full blood price. A saw come forth new creation. So Lord, when we see the price that it cost, help us to remember. You said do this and remember. And Father, we always have a choice. You had a choice. And you chose us. And so, Lord, tonight, we have a choice. And tonight, as your blood-bought, beautiful bride, we choose you. We choose you. Mighty warrior. Prince of Peace, our Goel, our kinsman redeemer. How we love you. I'd ask Kim if we could um, take communion. And we've got this cup. We have the bread. And I'd like to end tonight. Just come, take a piece of bread and dip it or drink. But when you do, exchange. In covenant, there's exchange. We exchanged weapons. We exchanged shoes. We exchanged robes. And Jesus wants exchange. He wants to give you his robe of righteousness. He wants to give you beauty for your ashes. But you know what? You gotta bring the ashes. <laughs> I was taking communion by myself one day and I um, said, oh Lord, I want your peace. And I knelt and I took communion and I received peace. I got up. He said, wait, 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 wait. I said, what? He said, you didn't bring me anything. 
You didn't bring me anything. It's exchange, Ruthie. It's an exchange. You want to be in covenant with me? Then I need that fear that's lurking in your heart. And I, I want that um, gossip you've been talking about your friend. I want the sin. I want to give you my joy and I want to take your mourning. I want to give you a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. So when you come here and you pick up this and you say, flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, bring to the table what he wants from you. Whatever it is, I don't know. But you know and he knows. He's asking you, come and exchange beauty for ashes.